most respected um, honorable chief minister, senior ministers from the government, senior officials, people who are on the video. Um, it is a <clears throat> very emotional moment for me. And uh, uh, all I can tell you is that I'm deeply honored and I'm deeply moved uh, for, the, for the opportunity that you have given to me to share a few things. It's a very, uh, very special moment for me because today my life has come full circle. I'll explain to you what I mean by that uh, in a few moments. For you to comprehend how today, this very day, my life has come full circle, I have to show you a few pictures. So <clears throat> this is the first photograph that was uh, taken of me uh, by a professional photographer. And uh, the me here is the smallest one. Uh, this happened in Keonjar. Some of you may know uh, the gentleman in dark glasses. At that time, he was a trainee IS officer, just joined as an assistant collector in Keonjar after joining the IS in 1966. Uh, this is my mother. Uh, this picture was taken a year before she became completely blind. Now, the interesting thing in this picture is the door behind uh, your ex-chief secretary. That door, if you pay attention to that door, you will see what a government quarter actually used to look like, and we shouldn't forget that. Uh, this is 1966, and this is 1972, same, same kid. So this picture will tell you how quickly boys grow up, or for that matter, young girls grow up. And this is a very precious photograph for me because this was my, uh, some of you know that I wrote a book called Go Kiss the World, but this is my first Go Kiss the World moment in my life. Uh, Sri Biju Patnaik, the legendary uh, statesman of India, uh, he was at that time actually the leader of the opposition. And uh, this prize is giving me in this photograph for uh, winning the championship for ODIA debate uh, organized by the Ravenshaw College at that time. Dr. Mohinder Raut, Bapankonare, Kaptaku, Dr. Mohinder Raut Institute, Karthile. And uh, I happened to be the champion uh, for the inter-college debate, so um, Sri Viju Patnaik came and gave it to me. So this is 1972. This was three years after that. This is 1975. I was fortunate enough to represent the state at the Republic Day Parade in New Delhi. And uh, this picture was uh, taken while Mrs. Indira Gandhi is presenting the, uh, the, uh, the trophy for being the best cadet of the country. And this is the first time that somebody from the state of Odisha brought the honor uh, to, the, uh, to the state. When um, you get the prime minister's uh, trophy and the cane of honor, it entitles you to have breakfast with the prime minister by tradition since uh, Sri Nehru's time. Uh, so at that time, the Prime Minister's residence was number one, Sabdajang Road. And uh, the lady that you find here in uniform is uh, now the Mrs. Kiran Bedi at that time. It was the first year that she had joined the IPS. And it was an international women's year. So she, for the first time, led Delhi police contingent on Rajpath, the first time a woman led the uh, parade. And uh, this lady here. Uh, the young lady, she was uh, Odisha's first woman paratrooper. And uh, she and me had done uh, paratrooping for the first time a year before. Uh, she is no more. Her name was Dharitri Pani. And you can see from the picture, uh, she was, Mrs. Gandhi was an extremely uh, gracious host. And here she is serving with her own hands. And this honor actually led to the next day being taken to the Rashtrapati Bhavan. Uh, to be introduced in person to, at that time, the president was Sri Fakiruddin Ali Ahmad. So all this is happening in 1975. Now, this picture is 1976, December 1976. So this picture says inter-university debate, uh, and this is University of uh, Punjab. And so why am I showing you this picture? I'm showing you this picture because 
in 1976, when this picture was taken, I was a lower division assistant in the industries department in this very building. And uh, when, uh, at that time, I used to study. I gave up my studies at the Utkal University, as you heard. And when I gave up my studies to just make my uh, family happy, I said, in the evenings, I'll go to the law college. It so happened that that year I represented the university through the law college in a couple of inter-university inter debates. And because it was representing the state, the government actually gave me a month's special leave to attend an inter-university debate in uh, Aligarh Muslim University and one in this place here that you see this picture. So this picture is very special to me, that I was here already in this building. I was an LD assistant here where in the hierarchy only the peon, uh, whose name was Ponda, was junior to me. And leaving Ponda aside, I was the junior most, uh, you know, functionary in the state. Um, this is my relieving order, dated 30th June 1977. And I have it for you. This is my most precious possession in my life. This is my relieving order from the industries department. And this is my passport. So I am who I am because of this land. And my starting point was this building. The reason I'm telling you this is yesterday, exactly 40 years after, I have relinquished all executive responsibilities at Mindtree, a company I co-founded. So life has brought me full circle. And it is symbolic. And is, I think it is God sent that I am here today in the same place where I had started my life. So my deepest gratitude to you for taking me back here. Thank you. So in that context, I now want to switch to the main body of my conversation. And when uh, Ms. Balakrishnan told me and then the Chief Secretary Sripadhi told me to come and talk to you, I said that I don't want to talk about IT. Uh, I want to talk about personal leadership because I have been a student of leadership all my life, and I watch leaders in the government, I watch leaders in not-for-profit organizations, I watch leaders across the world, um, and having worked with high-performance individuals, I have felt that there are interesting themes emerging, and I sought permission, can I speak about that? So they were gracious enough, and they said, you decide what the subject is, and I thank you for listening to me. You are leaders, and all the people who are listening in through the video conference are leaders in their own right. And I think government is a great repository of personal leadership and institutional leadership. So as leaders, when you look at leadership as a concept, I would like you to look at your own life through two dimensions. One is what I call platform, and the other is purpose. So if you look at your own personal identity, who you are, you will find that that identity is mostly a set of six things. First and foremost, your identity comes from your education. So where did you study? It was told that I studied in Utkal University. Somebody will say, oh, this individual studied in St. Stephen's. So somebody will say, I'm a product of Ra Ravensha College, Katak. Where you studied and what you studied becomes a very defining experience. And it stays with the rest of your life. So even today, you know, if you talk to uh, Mr. P.K. Jena, he will say his identity is IIT Kharagpur. Or Vishal Dev here will say, I'm from IIT Kharagpur and I'm from I am Lucknow. So where you studied and what you studied sticks to you. Even today when I go about, I say, I'm a student of DN High School in Keonja. So your education defines you. The second thing is your experience. So the officer who may retire as chief secretary who started in Kandamal will say, I was sub-collector in Kandamal. That is the starting point. Then you say, after my posting in so-and-so place, you know, I handled these three roles and responsibilities, and I went on deputation to so-and-so state in so-and-so year. So the defining idea of who you are as an individual and then as a leader comes from what you did. But in life, 
your and my education and experience, personal experience, will only take us this far. Because in true world, in the real world, there are big problems that cannot be solved by individual education and experience. And that's where your network comes in. The greatest example of network is the government itself. Your power comes from knowing which batchmate in OS and which batchmate in IAS or any other police or wherever is posted where. I grew up in a household where, apart from learning the ABCDs of the world, as a child you were taught to also read the civil list so that you get your fundamentals clear as to you know, what lies ahead of you and what lies behind you. So civil list actually will immediately tell you what is the network that you can fall back upon, whether it is in, the, uh, in an hour of uh, small need or a large need. So your network expands your capability. There are a lot of great people with great education and great experience, but they don't cultivate the network as well as somebody else does. And networks have a rule. It is like the network in the world of internet. Network rule is that you can't just suck the power of the network. You have to give before you get. So your network becomes very critical. Then becomes your net worth. And net worth not in the sense of a huge amount of money. Now imagine that there is a, a, a couple who both of them work and their ability to save is a little more than somebody else. In turn, that ability gives them the capacity to take risks. So because of their twin income, then they will say, I want to send my child to have higher education in so-and-so place. Or I will put a child in a you know, boarding school. Or they will say that I will leave this money for my nest egg. And the same principle applies to the world of business. So if you have a certain personal network that you have created, that you will be able to take risk, you can be an entrepreneur, or you can join politics, or you can do anything. So your net worth also defines your sense of who you are. The fifth thing is your family. Now, I have seen many outstanding leaders, many outstanding individuals actually don't go through the glass ceiling, not because of external reasons, but because their families pull them down. Our families either compete with us or collaborate with us to be able to be more impactful. And if you have the right family support, then you have a force multiplier right then and there. On the other hand, if you have a spouse, male spouse or a female spouse, who is continuously comparing you with somebody else, you know, who joined the service in the same year, who's got a larger quarter, was in Udyan Marg, whereas you are in some other place, and uh, is continuously saying, so what postings did you get? What posting the other person got? And there will come your nemesis. So your family is very, very critical. Last but not the least is your own body. We take it for granted. But imagine you coming to this talk of mine without your body. Nobody would particularly like you to be here if you decided to do that. So your body is your vehicle which takes you wherever you want to go. And I have seen a great many highly competent people who are let down by their own body before the ultimate final uh, defining role or responsibility that they otherwise could have taken. So broadly, you will find that these are the six things which together constitute your and my platform. It's a platform. Some people will say, so what about your values? Now the values are actually, I will argue, a function of these six things. You first learned your values by, uh, I mean values from your family. Then those values got refined through your education and experience. So whatever else you see, if you look at these six broad things, they actually define everything else. But this is only a platform. The platform by itself does not take us anywhere. What you do with that platform is defined by the purpose. I will actually argue that most of you in this room and listening over the video conference are very homogeneous. You are very similar. 
So there are lots of batchmates who join the OS or the OPS or the IPS or the IFS at the same time. They have very comparable intellect. Most people who join the government are highly intelligent people, highly capable people. Most come from a middle class or lower middle class families and have broadly the same kind of net worth, same kind of you know, physical capability at the beginning. Then what happens over the next 20 or 30 years or 40 years? So with the same platform, two different individuals, what they will do with that platform will be very, very different. And that then is determined by the purpose. What you do with your platform is determined by your purpose. Now what is purpose? Purpose is a very simple mathematical formula. Purpose is I to the power of T, which is impact you make over a period of time. Now, the, the, the other way of looking at it in very simplistic terms is your platform of those six things is nothing but a springboard. It's a place from where you launch yourself. It's a place that helps you to go someplace else. Now imagine that uh, a platform is no, no different from a railway platform. So you and I are going to the Bhuvaneshwar railway platform and you decide to take the train to Calcutta and from Calcutta you fly to New York City and you will deliver a talk at the United Nations uh, Climate Change Conference. Whereas I can go to the same platform, take a train, get down in Chaudhwar, okay, and do something else and come back to Bhuvaneshwar. The platform remains the same, the destination becomes very different, and the impact you make becomes radically different. So it is the purpose that leads you to make the impact. Now, unfortunately, great leaders, high achievers, over-focus on the platform. Continuously, they're sharpening their education, their experience, their network, their net worth, their family, and looking after the body, sometimes spending unwanted amount of time in the gym. But the focus, of course this is important, but this by itself will not take you and me anywhere. The focus has to be as much on the purpose, without which we'll basically go nowhere. Now, if you look at the whole thing as a two by two matrix, imagine platform on one side and purpose on the other side, you will get a set of four quadrants. So there are some people who will lead a low platform and a low purpose life. There are some people who will lead a low platform, high purpose life. And some of us will lead a high platform and a low purpose life. And some of us will actually go on to lead a high platform and high purpose life. Let me exemplify in simple terms. So many of you have come with rural background, I know that. Just as I say, I was raised in Koraput or Keunjar. I'm sure there are lots of you here who have come from the hinterland Odisha. And you are, good, you are all good students. And many of you, like me, went to probably a government school. And imagine in your eighth class or your ninth class, you had a set of friends who you have left behind or who have stayed back, decided to stay back. And those people, well, whereas you went, you came to Ravenshaw College, you went to St. Stephen's or Delhi University or JNU, you joined the services, you are in position of great significance today, those people have opted to stay back. So this best friend who was in your eighth class together with you actually is today uh, probably just managing a small uh, business on behalf of the family or taking up a small job in that district headquarter or the subdivisional headquarter and is essentially leading a low platform and a low purpose life. I'm sure you can think of some of your friends, right? Who, are no, who started very similarly but have stayed back where only your memory can reach them today. But by the way, this is not a lowly platform and not lowly purpose. We are just saying low platform and low purpose because if you remember, I said purpose is I to the power of T, which is impact you make over time. So there's nothing wrong about being low platform and low purpose. 
The only thing we have to keep in mind is they're making their own impact, but that impact is among their own family and friends. Impact is over a small group of people in a shorter span of time. The good news is these people, unlike you, and definitely unlike me, are attending all the birthdays, are attending all the weddings, and probably will, have not, will not have cardiac arrest, or have it long after I certainly will have. So, and the other interesting thing is that resource consumption is a lot less. They are people who would have the least demand on the environment, and their carbon footprint is very, very small. So these are people who are low platform and low purpose. Then come a group of people who are low platform and high purpose. Again, think of your friend in your 10th class or 11th class who did maths better than you. And sometimes you went to get your math clarified. And that young boy or young girl actually decided to be a school teacher and continues to be a school teacher and continues to teach children and has you know, no, no reason to come to Bhuvaneshwar or Katak or Bangalore or no need to become an you know, IT engineer at any point in time. Now this individual is today leading a life which is low platform but high purpose. This is also the quadrant of people who start up companies. All startups basically start as low platform and high purpose. That is how, you know, uh, Infosys was. That is how Apple was. So you begin in your startup journey as a low platform and a high purpose thing. That is the common thing among all startups. And that is also the quadrant for not-for-profit organizations. Most not-for-profit organizations, most NGOs actually are low platform and high purpose. Then of course there is the group of people who are high platform and low purpose. Now, this is a this is very brilliant uh, student whose entire trip in life was to either join the civil services or you know, join the Indian Institute of Management and his whole purpose was to get the best campus placement. You know, I landed on first day a 50 lakh, 50 lakh is too small these days, a one crore job. And then the guy who goes off to Silicon Valley, joins a multinational, comes back as India head of so-and-so company. Okay. Similarly, there could be a government servant whose entire trip in life was to uh, top the list, join the civil services, get the cadre of your choice, get the state of your choice, marry somebody who is high profile, and then, you know, have the beacon car, have the best house in the uh, most, uh, you know, prestigious uh, uh, part of the, um, you know, part of whatever uh, uh, state capital that you are in, get all the plum positions which are significantly away from the zone of war, and uh, finally, you know, you retire with full honor and full glory. So these are people who lead what I call a high platform and a low purpose life. Where uh, sometimes I see a red beacon car which is completely horribly stuck in traffic. It cannot move because there are 50 cars behind it and 50 cars on the side and 50 cars behind, but the red beacon nonetheless is going on and on and on. So this is a high platform, low purpose guy actually occupying the vehicle. And then there are a set of people among us who lead a high platform and high purpose life. Where not only they are using a high platform, and by the way, government is necessarily high platform. Government anywhere in the world is a great example of high platform. But they also have a high purpose. So these are four quadrants, and you can, you know yourself right this moment in which of the four quadrants you are in. And just the same way when I present it to people, people can figure out in which of the four quadrants their organization is. So this can be even uh, extended to looking at an organization. It can be extended to even analyze a society and sometimes not sometimes, it can also be extended to look at a country. So different countries in the world, you can place them in these four quadrants. 
Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about the key drivers of these four sets of people in four sets of quadrants. In the lowermost quadrant, which is low purpose and low platform, the most important driver is existence. So this friend you have left behind, what is it that this friend, okay, is most of the times engaged in? This friend is most of the times engaged in existence-related issues. So he's thinking, while you are thinking about, you know, uh, meeting the government's plans or creating the government's plans, and you are thinking about all the development initiatives, and most of the times bigger issues are engaging you, this individual right now is thinking about, you know, coming summer will be a good idea to repair the roof. Or this individual is thinking about the LIC premium has been paid or not paid. And again, I want to reinstate force that there's nothing wrong with this. So day-to-day -day existence becomes very important. Has the child gone to school today? Has the child done the, uh, you know, tuition today? Uh, is, is, you know, everything okay in terms of the immediate family member's health? Those are the kind of things that this individual is most of the time actually uh, uh, engaged with. People who are high purpose and low platform which are startup companies, not-for-profit companies, uh, not-for-profit organizations, the driver there usually is a couple of things. One is altruism. Altruism is about the human need to make a larger impact for others. Altruistic uh, tendencies are built into each one of us, but for some people it's a very strong driver, where you are continuously driven by the desire to make things better for somebody else. So that's altruism. So when somebody decides, somebody brilliant like you, decides, no, I'm not going to join the government, I'm not going to join the private sector, I want to actually work for an organization that takes care of upliftment of sex workers' children. Now that individual is driven by altruism. Similarly, it is not just altruism. For a startup company, it could be path creation. So these are people who are path creators and not path dependent. You will find that there are two kinds of people broadly in the world. Some people are path creators. They will create a path where no path exists before. And there are some people who are classically path dependent. So they will walk very well if the path already exists. Both kinds of people are necessary in the world. The first category will decide where the world will go, and the next category, who are very important, are people who will ensure that the path will be walked well. So path creation becomes a very dominant uh, requirement for people in this quadrant. The people who are high platform and low purpose, the most important requirement for them is consumption. They need to consume, they need to consume in an unstoppable manner. And the classical example that I have of this is the face of Rahu. imagine Rahu is never shown with a full body. So whatever you feed goes into an endless pit. But there are Rahus among us as well. So where we are continuously wanting to consume. Now what do you consume? You consume the government quarter. Okay, so if I am in a type 7 house, I now need a type 8 house. That is consumption. My child is going to a good school, but now I have to send that child to a public school. But my neighbor then comes after the Delhi posting and the neighbor's kid goes to an international school. So this kid now needs to go to an international school. So we consume education as well. So whether it is material or it is sometimes intellectual, consumption becomes the most dominant requirement. If you stop them from consuming, then their whole world comes collapsing. So consumption becomes a very important driver. For the people who are high platform and high purpose, the most dominant requirement becomes sense of legacy. These are people who are obsessed with leaving something behind. You might have come back, uh, you know, many, many years back as the subdivisional officer, the collector, or the revenue divisional commissioner, or the industry secretary, or the chief secretary, or whatever, or the minister. Now, you are really 
consumed by the need to leave things better than you inherited. That is the sense of legacy. And some people value the need for creation of legacy way more than anything else. So that becomes the dominant characteristic. Now, for a moment, I don't want to leave behind the idea with you that these are judgmental positions and one is necessarily better than the other. Point I'm trying to make, and I'll make this point again later, is that you and I got to know where we are and not have confusion about that. Because it's not a CCR issue. You know, sometimes I can hoodwink my boss and get the right CCR, okay? I alone know, not my boss, not my spouse, not my child, I alone know right this moment, where am I? Am I there out of choice? Am I there out of compulsion? Or am I kidding myself? But in each of the quadrants, there are vulnerabilities, and I want to share some of those vulnerabilities with you. People who are in the lowermost quadrant, their biggest vulnerability is false comparison. What is false comparison? That you know, kid that you have left behind in your age standard, who is running a pharmaceutical shop, or is uh, currently you know, working as a small uh, employee in a private sector company somewhere in, uh, you know, let's say, uh, 25 kilometers away from Jagat Singhpur or from uh, Raigada or wherever it is, that kid will say, you know, what was so special about PK Jena? He used to come and get his maths clarified from me. Now look at where he has gone. Movie It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in this lifetime. Sir, I hope it was okay to take that example. So this is false comparison because that guy does not know what is Mr. Jena's life script has been. And it is very inappropriate to say that I also could have been in his place. And I see it all the time in, in private sector, one of the things that you will find, particularly among doctors and particularly among R&D engineers, they will say, you know, I always was a smarter one. I knew better, I was more competent, but that fellow knew how to use PowerPoint slides better. Okay. So as if it, life is so simple that all you have to do is make a nice PowerPoint presentation and the world thinks that you are, you, you are better than somebody else. It is false comparison. The problem with people who have high purpose and low platform is usually fear of scale. They're afraid of scale. And that is why not-for-profit organizations many times, they are actually quite distrustful of two categories. One is the distrustful of government, because government to them is scale. Similarly, they're quite distrustful about big business, because big business is about scale. Scale scares them for whatever reason. But there are some problems in life that can be handled only with the power of scale. So if somebody wants to fix the malaria problem in uh, the developed, developing countries, you cannot do that without having Bill Gates' money. It is a different story that much of that money came by selling buggy products, okay? But that's fine. Similarly, Bill Gates can't do it unless Bill Gates engages with the government. So there is no other power as you know, as significant as a platform as, as the government anywhere in the world. The capacity of the government to move in times of need is absolutely unmatched. Whether it is in terms of eradication of uh, diseases, whether it is in terms of alleviation of poverty, whether it is in terms of managing disaster, or it is a matter of national security. Nothing moves like the government. But these people are very afraid. And in fact, most of the people in this quadrant, they blame the government or business for most of the problems that is facing the world today. So fear of scale. People on the top left corner, their biggest vulnerability is irrelevance. They think that they're very critical. They think that they're very important. So this is the red beacon getting stuck in a traffic syndrome. 
They think that the whole world is actually moving because of them, but the fact of the matter is that quite irrelevant for each one who's going to move out from that same government quarter or same gated community in the case of public sector, that 20 other people will come and move in. Life goes on. Life was there before them. Life will go on pretty well after them. The people who are high platform and high purpose, they also have vulnerabilities. And the most critical vulnerability, uh, vulnerability is they can become emperor without clothes. The reason for that is that they can get so obsessed with themselves or their ideas, however lofty those ideas may be. They, be, they may be making critical mistakes and because you are in that quadrant, nobody will tell you that you're making a mistake. Nobody will go and bring the bad news to you. So if somebody is in that quadrant, the risk is very high in terms of being blindsided. So you can get into the emperor without clothes syndrome. Now, the things that we should know is that we should not have a false notion of where we are. I've made that point earlier. Second important point is to know that wherever we are, we should be, it should be a matter of choice. The third thing, this is a very important point that we should know, is that no particular quadrant is a permanent entitlement. Just because you are there does not mean you will be there all your life. In fact, I find that many people, at least two to three times in their life, they change quadrants. It does not happen every day. It does not happen every year. You may change roles and responsibilities. You may change your portfolio as a minister. But normally, major systemic large-scale movement happens only maybe two or three times in an entire lifespan. The interesting thing is that if you look at this slide here, there are many people, for example, who start as low platform and high purpose. So imagine that there's a doctor who starts, and I know some of those doctors in SCB Medical College stay all their life there, and then they serve so well that they come out with original thinking and original ideas and original models, and then that one day might take them to high platform or high purpose. So similarly, Apple started as low platform, high purpose. Apple started in a garage, or Infosys started with Mrs. Sudha Murthy giving 10,000 rupees to Narayan Murthy, but eventually went to high platform and high purpose. Similarly, if you stay too long in high platform and high, low purpose, chances are very high that you'll move left. People who are in high platform and low purpose, they seldom go to the right side of the quadrant. And there are examples. For example, the conversion of Ashoka the Black to Ashoka the Benevolent was a classic example of moving from high platform and low purpose. Conquest was a low purpose thing, to moving to high platform and high purpose. But sometimes when you are there in far too long in that quadrant, you might drop to low platform and low purpose. There are enough examples that you can think where people who are high platform and high purpose actually go to low platform and low purpose, and usually that movement happens in the blink of an eye. Do you know what happened to the earlier IMF chairman who was supposed to run for the French uh, prime ministership and on whom critically the revival of Europe was dependent. And all that, was, that, that came in the way of this man was indiscretion in a New York hotel. And within a matter of minutes, you know, from high platform, high purpose, he came down to low platform and low purpose. And that was the end of the man. Never been heard about before. So normally, while high platform, low purpose, or low platform, high purpose to any other quadrant can take a little more time, from high platform, high purpose to low platform, low purpose, the journey takes the smallest amount of time and usually is a one-way street. Usually is a one-way street. So with that, uh, I want to actually come pretty close to the end of my conversation and then we can have a few questions and answers. Let us look at the rightmost quadrant of high platform and high purpose. And let's talk about people who 
occupied that quadrant and what typically is the characteristic of these people. First and foremost, these people are driven by a sense of purpose, obviously. I met the Dalai Lama one day after his 74th birthday. I used to write a column for Forbes India called Zen Garden. And this column was basically an entrepreneur speaking to another fellow entrepreneur. And in the process, pick up some you know, nuggets of wisdom, which then I could hold to my readers. And once in a while, we made a departure from it and spoke to somebody who classically did not fit into the definition of an entrepreneur. So in one issue, we decided that we'll talk to the Dalai Lama about what the Buddha would have said to the world of business if the Buddha was born today. And uh, we profiled the Dalai Lama as a CEO of the soul. So this was happening, as I was telling you, on the day after his 74th birthday. Long conversation. And I was curious. I asked him, look, you know, you fled Tibet when you were only 16 years of age. And, you know, yesterday you completed 74. Since the time you fled Tibet, your whole purpose in life is to free Tibet. But you know and I know it is not going to happen in your lifetime. Now, here am I from the private sector where every quarter I must meet my goals, my numbers, otherwise the stock market will thrash me or my stakeholders will dump me. So I, if, if I miss my goals, my objectives, my number, for even a quarter, I get into deep depression. And here you are, you have not met your goal from the time that you were 16 and today you are 74. But tomorrow morning, when your door opens, there is camera, there are uh, television crew, there are people, there are you know, emissaries from international governments, and of course there are your fellow Tibetans who look up to you for optimism, look, look up to you for joy, look up to you for self-confidence. And your number one job, if I have understood correctly, is to smile. You know, Dalai Lama cannot look unhappy, sullen, sad, depressed. So my question to him was, where do you get the power to smile? So he smiled, and he said, your purpose determines your power. The power is not inside of you. The moment you are driven by a lofty purpose, you will have no idea where the power will come from. We all know how the state dealt with the Falin cyclone. Now, this state is as equipped, probably less equipped than many other states. This state is as good or as, you know, as uh, resource starved as probably anybody else. But how did this state deal with that cyclone in such a fast, furious manner that the cyclone became a study of international and national level, not only in the government sector, but private sector study of how it was actually handled. It was purpose of a certain set of people, and that purpose gave them the power. The second important thing to keep in mind is people in this quadrant are not driven by data. They're driven by feelings. Now, feelings come from emotions. And in the last century, we were told not to be emotional. The moment an officer is emotional, walks into your room, the first thing you say is, don't be emotional. Sit down, sit down, have a cup of tea, have a glass of water. You know, don't be emotional. So we are told all our life not to be emotional. But the most significant things in life are acts of emotion. They're not acts of reason. Starting from the uh, Big Bang, to the fact that you and me are born, I don't think our parents did a business plan to have us. So we are children of emotion. We are acts of emotion. The word emotion actually comes from a Greek word which literally means emotion is a feeling that moves. So an emotion is a feeling that has power to move something from place A to place B. So that is why the word emotion is a combination of E and motion. So emotions are very powerful uh, elements of change. So if you look at uh, you know, 
uh, you would have seen Attenborough's film Gandhi, and you would remember that sequence where he was thrown onto the platform by a South African train conductor. At that moment, the man decides that apartheid is fundamentally wrong for the world. That is an emotional response. That is not a data-driven response. That was not a you know, response born out of cloud-based analytics. So the most fundamental changes that you will be able to make in your life, or I will be able to make in my life, is because you are deeply stirred about something. The officer, the minister, the legislator, who will actually be very concerned about child welfare, very concerned about poverty alleviation, very con concerned about children uh, in slums who need to have the proper education. These are not data-driven things. Data is important, but the first, the deepest, the innermost thing is it's, it's basically feelings. These people necessarily have a long view of time. They say Rome wasn't built in a day, neither was Kalinga built in a day, nor can Bhuvaneshwar get built in a day. It will take a lifetime to make a difference. It's a very important point because many competent leaders in government sector and in private sector gets very exasperated. You figured out what the city needs. I figured out what my company needs. And theoretically, we are correct. But it is taking forever. Or people are misunderstanding me. People are not going along with me. Now, we must have humility as leaders that sustainable change will take its own time. It's very critical to respect the systemic need and desire and capacity to change, and we cannot get exasperated with it. So sometimes it takes a lifetime to make a difference. We think of national independence, and we think of August you know, 15, 1947. And in a sense, we even think that Gandhi's ability to deliver that freedom was probably a matter of few days, quit India movement of 1942 being a watershed development for the country. What people don't realize, how many years actually elapsed between the time that Gandhi was thrown on that railway platform to the time Indian independence was delivered. It took more than 50 years for Indian independence to be delivered. So we need to be impatient for results Absolutely no question about that, because the world is not going to wait. But we must have the humility to know that if I truly am here to make a difference, it will take me a lifetime to build a difference. And last but not the least, these are people who are driven by the power of vision. The most uplifting definition of leadership that I have come across as a student of leadership in my life is a leader is a person others opt to follow, to go someplace they wouldn't go by themselves. A man called Joel Barker, who's an American futurologist, has come out with this very simple definition of leadership. A leader is a person others opt to follow, to go someplace they wouldn't go by themselves. So people pretty much know what is good for them. But you know what? They will not go there. They will not go from point A to point B. So people know what is good for them, but it is the arrival of the leader. And then it is the moment where people opt to follow that leader, and the leader then helps them to cross the chasm to go from point A to point B. So the first deliverable of a leader, therefore, is the vision to say, I will take you there. That is your natural entitlement. So whether it is Jack Welch or Narayan Murthy, or it is Moses who took his people to the promised land, the most important requirement of leadership for people who have the sense of legacy, for people who are high platform and high purpose, is to have that abiding sense of vision. With that, I would like to conclude by quoting this very dear set of four lines for me from the Kathopanishad. It says, you are what your deep driving desire is. As is your desire, so is your will. As is your will, so is your act. As is your act, so is your destiny. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the great honor and thank you for listening to me.